On this episode, a presentation on getting started with amateur radio operations in the field. This is the Field Radio Podcast. I'm your host, John Jacobs, W7DBO, Whiskey 7, Delta Bravo Oscar. Thank you for clicking and tuning in and joining in on this podcast. In the past few months, I have given a presentation on getting started with amateur radio operations in the field. The first presentation was for the Gloucester County Amateur Radio Club in New Jersey via Skype, and the second for the Utah Digital Communications Conference here in Utah. So for this podcast, I will give this presentation. I hope you enjoy. In this presentation, I'll be speaking to getting started with amateur radio portable operations. This source material can be found at my blog website at w7dbo.net, whiskey7deltabravooscar.net. Just a quick background on myself. I'm a third-generation general class licensee since 1996. In my professional career, I work in state government, online training, education. I have my bachelor's in information technology and my master's of education in instructional design. The equipment I use is at my home base is an ICOM 7300 with a hex beam that's about ready to be put up, hopefully someday when the weather gets a little warmer. Uh, in the field, I use an ICOM 7200, a chameleon and buddy pole antennas. I also have a 706 Mark IIG and a little Tar Heel for my vehicle, for my truck. For VHF, I use my D710GA and typically either a diamond antenna or a J-pole. For my handheld, I use my THD74A, and hopefully, if I'm good this year, the item that was coming is the IC9700 that's yet to be released. So my background mostly in field radio operations is working special events. Here you can see it's either mobile support for bike events or running an aid station at ultra runs and that type of events. So this is the most of the where I'll be speaking from is having your gear organized and available for either emergency communications or event support, but this certainly does apply to any operations in the field. A couple channels where you can find me at, fieldradiopodcast.org is where the, my podcast is. On YouTube at Field Radio Podcast is where I re reside all the podcast episodes plus videos. And then also my blog website, which is w7dbo.net. When you talk about goals of operating, I espouse four ideas. You should have four primary goals. Number one, get on the air. Number two, stay on the air. Number three, be an effective communicator. And four, have fun. You see a lot of times, especially with event support, somebody will get on the air, and then a half hour later, they'll, they'll go quiet after they check in on the net. And that's because they were able to get on the air, but they weren't able to stay on the air. So your goal is, is not only get your equipment functioning, but be able to keep your equipment maintained and operating so you can stay on the air. You also want to be an effective communicator because it doesn't do much if your equipment's on the air, if you're not able to effecti effectively communicate. And the last one is have fun. This is a hobby, either through volunteering our time for special event supports or emergency communications, but this all still is a hobby. And so we have to remember, if we're not having fun, then this isn't a very fun hobby to be in. I look at the philosophy of use, and this goes for any equipment that I acquire and build out for outdoor portable operations or even indoor. So you have to identify what is your purpose or goal. This is going to save you a lot of money in the end if you can identify in the beginning what your purpose and goal is, and then you identify what your equipment is. What is it? And more, more importantly, what is it not? Uh, what is it not going to do? If you can define those parameters, what it is, what it is not, and what is your purpose or goal, then you can fine-tune your equipment instead of trying to take on blanket statements of being able to perform all modes, all bands, all conditions. Uh, that gets a very big equipment list very fast. And then lastly, what does success look like? So what is success to you? Is it be able to get on to a soda and to be able to activate a summit? Or is it be able to operate an aid station at event support and be able to transfer all the names and numbers in emergency traffic and wrap up at the end of the day without going off the air. So what does success look like? And then that way you can start working towards those goals. So let's put this into play for my philosophy of use example with my handheld radio go bag. Now I have a full video on this bag breaking down what it is, 
And so I'll link it here in the show notes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see up in the top right corner a link to that video. So with my handheld radio go bag, what's the purpose? Well, it's two-way local communication, so that defines it down pretty fast. Uh, it's two-way and it's local. And what it is, it's VHF communications. It supports my cell phone, so it has batteries or whatever I need to keep my cell phone going. And then it has GPS and basic tools. So what is this bag not? It's not my primary HT. This is my bag that stays in the trunk that comes out uh, when needed. And it is not a 72-hour kit or basic life survival gear. So by doing that, I've been able to define down to what exactly this equipment is. And then what does success look like? I'm able to establish and maintain communications, whether that's my cell phone or that's my HT. I like the term field expedient equipment. That sets the tone that your equipment going into the field uh, needs to be something that's portable, organized, tested, modular, and understood. So we'll go into five of those items for field expedient equipment. First of all, portable. Now, to you is portable, to me is different, and to other people. So everybody has their own unique identification of what is portable. Uh, to somebody that is going up on a soda summit, uh, it is a very lightweight, fits in a very small part of the backpack, and that is portable. To others, it may be something like you see here on the left, a very large box if you're looking at this on YouTube. Or if you're the military, it's whatever fits on a pallet. So you define what portable is and then know that this is one of your goals to field expedient equipment. Organized. Now up in the top left corner, you can see there's a sock drawer with socks that are individually identified. Now, I don't know who actually has socks organized this way in their drawer, but I certainly don't. I'm just lucky they match colors. But you need to think of that level of being organized with your gear. Having bags inside of bags and have everything very compartmentalized so it's loadout ready. And you have Velcro straps on all of your cables, so you're not grabbing into a handful of bag of tangled up cables. One thing that I like to do is uh, put checklist that sits on the top of the bag once you open the bag. And there's a checklist in there that I print every time I repack the bag. And it has everything that's checked off. So I pull out that list and I know exactly what's in that bag. And then I also note what last time the batteries were charged. Now, Stuart Thomas, KB1HQS, had a great idea for these remove before flight tags that you stick to your bag if you've pulled or altered that bag, if it's not ready to go out in the field. And in the show notes, I'll link to that video where I, I kind of talked about those tags or in the, if you're watching this on YouTube at the top upper right-hand corner, uh, you can link over to that video. So the next one is tested. So this is very important, especially with field radio equipment, is you want to have this level of progression of your equipment. You want to first test all your equipment on the bench. This is where you work out all the bugs. You work out what it's doing, what it's not doing, what works, what doesn't work, what you need to fix, what adapters you need. Everything's easily done in your workbench. The next one I like to call is the kitchen loadout. And my wife loves this one. This is where I take all the equipment and I go into the kitchen. I remove myself from my office and my workbench and I set up everything on the kitchen counter. Now, I count how many times I walk back to the workbench or walk downstairs or out in the garage to find a cable or find something, and then I know I'm not ready to go out in the field with this equipment because if I can't set it up in a different room of my house, then how am I going to be successful in the field with this? So the next one is I go into the backyard, and this can be just simply just set up on your porch or set up on your back patio. So once again, you go out, you load the equipment out, you set it up, you operate, you break down. And if you didn't find yourself walking back into somewhere to find some missing item, then you know you're ready to head out in the field. So then go to a local park and call it a local park activation and just get a little bit away from home where there's not high consequences of failure and just try once again setting up your gear and getting used to what's working. And then you're ready to go on location. Now, for me with events, if I'm going to a new aid station location, I'll go up the weekend before, 
try and hit the repeaters you're supposed to hit, try and hit the simplex frequencies, and just get a feel for what's going on. If it's a soda activation, try going to one where you don't have such a long hike to get to the top. Or if it's field day, a lot of times it's interesting, people will go do field day without even going up and seeing what conditions are like in the area the weekend before or just before. So if it's a new location, just scout out the location and try operating from there. And then once you've done all this, then you're ready for your live event. The next step in field expedient equipment is modular. You want to break down everything so it's in modular fashion. Now, if you can see here on the picture, on if you're watching this on YouTube, this was my old rack system where I had power, I had HF, and I had VHF, UHF with another HF radio, all in three separate rack cases. They used to all be in one big, huge case. It was a 12U or whatever, and it was my go, no, go case. It never left the desktop. It was too heavy. But at least now if I needed all three items, I could load out three separate cases. If I did an event where I only needed one of the cases, I could take one and leave the other. And so if you have modular equipment, now I do boxes. And so everything is separate. The power supply from the solar charge controller, from the battery to the radio, everything is in separate boxes. That way if I'm doing an event and I know I'm not going to have AC power, well, then I can leave my power supply at home. If I know I'm using solar, I can bring my solar charge controller. And that solar charge controller is not embedded inside a battery box. So now I can move that solar charge controller around to different battery boxes and charge different things. Now, I do have a small battery that's inside the radio box. And the only reason why I've done that is because that's so I can get, when I get to an area, I can immediately get up and running quickly without having to do a lot of setup. And so I do have a bio NO power, 12 amp hour that sits inside my radio box, but my bio NO power 40 amp hour is my primary uh, off the grid power. And that comes in a separate box. Now, if you're modular up to the lightest fashion, you might just have your radio and a small battery in a bag. But if you have all these things separated out, you'll be able to pick and choose the equipment you need to use at the right time. Now, the last one of field expedient equipment is understood. You need to know the capabilities and limitations of your equipment. You need to have regular practice at home. The radio I use in the field is the radio I use at home for my VHF, UHF. I check into the nets. I go out in the field and use the same radio. So it's not a mystery to me that when the summer comes and I'm uh, supporting an event, I'm not foreign to that equipment. I've used that equipment weekly. I know the menus and I'm very, very familiar with it. And experiment with functions. Find out the full capabilities of your radio. And then I love the cheat sheets that come along. You can download them online or there's those ones that you can get laminate in a book. But I like to make my own cheat sheets because the way I think of things is different than how everybody else thinks of things. So make your own cheat sheets and make sure to take your manual in the field. And then identify common failure points and mitigate that with your equipment. So the next item to talk about in field operating is reasonable redundancy. Try and standardize all your connections. As Jeremy and George would say from the workbench, power pole the world. Standardize all your connections with your antenna, your power, and anything else you may have. Last thing you want to do is get in the field and start having to diagnose a problem and start swapping things out and find out that you have connectors that are not compatible with each other. And where feasible, duplicate your equipment. I always take two radios. If I'm doing an event, I always take two radios out in the field because the last thing I want to do is have a radio go down and then we're completely off the air. Have spare fuses and parts. Try and get all your antenna components with wing nuts so you don't have to use tools. But those little bags of spare parts at Home Depot are only a dollar. They're only a dollar at Home Depot, but they're priceless in the field when you drop something into the grass. Have common battery requirements. If you have something that uses lesser or higher voltage, work to get them all working on the same voltage through converters. And in the prepper community, they have the term two is one and one is none. So try and think about that with reasonable redundancy with your equipment in the field. The next item to discuss is power management. Now, this is something where you can end up spending a whole lot of money if you don't identify your goal. So with power management, identify your requirements and set your goals. Now, for you, you may have the same equipment that I have, 
that your power requirement is going to be different because you operate the radio differently. If you're running a contest versus running net control or just being an aid station, all these are different power requirements with exact same equipment. So try and identify energy efficient devices. Work through everything you have from your laptops to your even your lights and try and find out if you can get equipment that is most energy efficient to use. One thing you need to decide is, especially now, is are you going to go with LIFEPO4 lithium iron phosphate batteries or are you going to do lithium ion or AGM? Now, there's benefits to both. You're going to spend more money up front doing LIFEPO4, but in the long run, you're actually going to get more bang for your buck. You're going to get a laster longing battery and you're going to be able to use the battery much longer than an AGM battery. But if you're just getting started in the field and you're not looking to invest that much money, an AGM battery is a great way to go, then upgrade when you're able to. And then look at solar power options. And this goes back to your goal. What are you trying to do? If you're soda, you may just want to get an extra 15 to 20 minutes operating at the end of the day, and that might be your success for solar power. If you're emergency communications, you may have the goal of power management be a 24-7 operation without the use of generators. And so that's going to drastically change your power requirements and how many panels you need. So in the beginning, set your goals, identify your requirements, find energy deficient devices, choose your battery, and then look at solar panel options as a viable solution to save on getting bigger batteries. The next thing to look at is antenna selection. And so with this, I'm just going to kind of walk through what I use and I always say when people ask, what's the best antenna? I'll say the best antenna is the one you left at home. So for portable operations, the N9 Tax roll-up J-Pole antenna is the best one I've seen by far, and I've owned many roll-up J-Pole antennas. The mini pack antenna that George from the Workbench makes is a great option for ultralight portable operations. And then also have a Windcamp Gypsy that I've loved using. And then lastly, the buddy pole, which is the erector set of antennas. That's a fun one to have in camp when you just want to play around with different configurations. For event support, I have an open stub J-Pole antenna, a Diamond X50A, an Aero VHF Yagi, and then also a UHF Yagi. So those are the primarily the four antennas that I use for event support. Now in my vehicle, I have a Browning dual band antenna. And then after Dayton this last year, I was sent one of a compact antenna, which is a very interesting little 7-inch antenna that either sits on a mag mount base or I got a grounding kit for it. Um, and that is a great little tiny antenna that you can use for your vehicle if you're trying to get low profile. This last year, we ran it through Latoja doing APR speakening, and I look back on the logs and it seems like we were able to beacon right through the whole course with that antenna on medium power. For field day, I use the Chameleon Skyloop. And this next year, we're going to try out a hex beam. And then also, I'm taking my Comet CHA250B off the roof, and I'm going to try and turn that into a vertical Invis antenna of some type. So when you talk about antennas for the field, I'll always say it depends. What is your goal? And what is your weight requirements or your setup time? Now, an easy way to get your roll-up J-Pole or the pack antenna into the air is to use Arbor's weight and throw rope. This is what's used by those in tree trimming business to get their larger ropes up in the air. And so I love using that because you can just throw that up in the air into the tree. You hook a tree, and then you just start pulling your lines up and tie them off. Now for mass selection. My favorite mast, hands down, is the Harbor Freight flagpole antenna. This is a very rigid flagpole antenna that, as you can see here in the picture on the right, if you're watching on YouTube, it can hold up a two-meter vertically polarized Yagi offset without it bending or bowing. And then it also has another antenna. So this is a great collapsible. You can use a drive-on base or you can strap it to a fence post or whatever you can find. That is my go-to antenna. Now, I also use a painter pole mast, and those I can kind of strap easily to the easy ups, but you have to make sure that whatever you're putting on the top is straight aligned with it because they will start bowing if you play them out over half their distance. They start to bow a little bit. 
The next one is military poles. That is a great option. Or light speaker stands or fiberglass telescoping poles. Now, it's important to remember with this, safety first. Guy your lines, then raise your antennas. Last thing you want to do is set up your antenna, turn around to grab your guy lines, and you find your antenna on the ground and everything is broken along with it. So especially with event support, and you have people coming into an aid station or an emergency communication center, and you have your lines, and people are unaware of where your lines are. So tag everything else with flagging tape, mark your perimeter, and just think about you don't want your line to come down on somebody's head. A few items left to discuss, and this is backcountry planning. Now, in metro area, emergency support is usually 5 to 10 minutes away. The farther you get out in the country, the farther emergency support is for you. If you go off asphalt and you go onto a dirt road, depending on where you are, the ambulance is not going to come to you. It's going to be search and rescue. And that search and rescue is typically a volunteer force that has call-out procedures. So the farther you get away from civilization, the more danger you put yourself in. So you need to plan your trips into the backcountry and think about safety. Communicate your plan. Let a family member or somebody know where you're going and when you'll be back. Learn about weather observation. Storms can come up fast, and interestingly enough, what we do is we go out in the field and we set up lightning rods. Learn about first aid and trauma pack. There's a program out called Stop the Bleed, which talks about using heavy bandages or tourniquets. Get some first aid training and get some first aid gear. And lastly, set some personal minimums. Decide that the conditions have to be what before you'll go out. Don't push the limits and say, well, I really wanted to go out today and I know it's going to be bad weather or I'm going to be putting myself in a little bit riskier prediction. Set your minimums of what it's going to be like and what safety you're going to have surrounding you before you go out in the backcountry. There's a saying in the aviation industry, better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than being in the air and wishing you were on the ground. Lastly, if you want to learn more about portable operating for amateur radio, I highly recommend Stuart Thomas's book, KB1HQS. It is portable operating for amateur radio. Everything you need to know to get on the air in the great outdoors. Stuart Thomas, KB1HQS, has been on the show with us, and he has some great advice for what he does with portable operating. So it's a must-read book if you want to learn more about operating in the field. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you want a copy of the slide deck, it can be found at W7DBO, Whiskey 7, Delta Bravo Oscar dot net or on the field radio podcast in the show notes. Thank you. This will do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. As always, please send me your comments, feedback, and show ideas to fieldradiopodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word, fieldradiopodcast at gmail.com. That is a new email address for me. Until next time, 73.